God is moving this summer. We celebrate all that he's doing. It's not a sleepy summer spiritually. God is on time all the time. And God is changing lives across the sound. He's changing our hearts and our lives, our homes. We're grateful for all the testimonies. We're in a series right now, Unite. And there's one thing you can't do alone. None of us can do alone. That's unite. We're designed, we're made to unite with God and unite with one another. This summer we've been growing in our relationships together, growing in our unity. And as we prepare for the fall, this fall, Lord willing, we're going to go through the book of Acts, 84 days of soaring. And the Bible says those who hope in the Lord will soar on wings like eagles. This is going to be daily devotions, life groups, the weekend messages. If you've never read the book of Acts, it would be a great opportunity to go through this book of the Bible. You could start now, get a head start. And if you've gone through it several times, we're going to go through it deeper. We don't just want to know the book of Acts, we want to live it together. And God is guiding us all as one church family. Uh, today we're going to highlight on uniting through serving. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for the inspiring work that you're doing locally and globally. God, we celebrate all of it and we give you praise. Father, I pray that this morning we would calm our hearts and we would open our ears and we would hear your voice. And God, you would change, shift, we would align, we would recalibrate, we would come home to you and we would live out all you've called us to be and to do. And we commit this to you in Jesus' name, amen. We're united through serving God together. And our team from Honduras just returned. Thank you for all of the prayers. Here's some pictures. And they have returned safely. God has protected them. A united team together traveling to Honduras. There were four VBS events. Main event is something we had here in our campus. And then now it traveled to Honduras. There were over 550 kids at four different schools. That was intentional, to go into the schools. And then we have international partners, the Sabios are there for all of the follow-up. And because this is really surrounding their neighborhood and in their schools, the kids will be able to go to church as well that wanna connect with a church family. God has answered prayers through relationships, through sharing the gospel, through translators, through love, through the kids. And we're excited that it didn't stop there. But there's a connection between our church in Honduras that's going to continue to grow. And the Sabios continue to serve there. Isn't it exciting to send people out and then see what God does as we literally travel around the world with the love of Jesus? Amen. <laughs> and all that the team learned from the people in Honduras. Our next trip is Cambodia. That's coming up in a couple months. If you're interested in going on one of these trips, just write down or talk in the connecting card, missions trips, I wanna hear more because we're ascending church and some go out long-term, some go out short-term, but God has called all of us to be ministers, priests, and ambassadors where we live, work, learn, or play and to the ends of the earth. So it's a joy to do that together. And as we serve, we grow in our faith. Serving is our calling. Serving together strengthens relationships. And unity grows the more we serve. We've been highlighting four different ways that God works at the same time in our hearts, in our homes, in our church, and then also in our city. God not just wants to work one hour, one place, one building, one day as we gather, but it really begins in our hearts and then the environment spiritually in our homes as we gather together, embers, not isolated, come together, there's a bonfire and there's an overflow and our cities are transformed. That's been God's design and plan throughout the entire Bible and today and until Jesus returns. Now we live this out and here's a key shift in terms of going from cultural Christianity to biblical Christianity. It's this, this key. God is the source of all of our blessings and he blesses us so that we can bless other people. 
The first half is to acknowledge that what God gives us, he blesses us. And we thank him, we praise him, we lift up our hands, we give him the highest praise for all God gives us. But if that's all of your vision, then your vision is just gonna be stuck and small in God, what else are you gonna give me? And I want more and I'm gonna hoard more. So today when we think about unity, the blessings from God are the first half of the vision. But the second half of the vision is what we bring and pass on to other people. I'm gonna focus today on mentoring, serving and mentoring, that combination. When you mentor, you share what you have and you also learn from those you mentor. We're gonna look at that specific area through some different relationships in the Bible. When the word mentoring comes to mind, there's a wide range of expressions. You might pass along some of your knowledge, your skills. There might be elements of character, resources, opportunities you invite people into, positions, wisdom, faith. God has given you so much. Is my mic run a little hot? Uh, can you turn it down a little bit? I'm just hearing some feedback, thank you. Uh, and, and think about all God's given to you and then think about how you can bring that to other people as you mentor. Simply this, pass along what God has given to you. If God has saved you, God wants to use you to see more saved. God has healed you, more healed. God gives you hope, more people experience this hope. God encourages you, encourage other people. God's gifted you, you're gonna build up and empower and help train more people with gifting. God teaches you how to read the Bible, you're gonna help others to read the Bible. Mentoring is at the core of unity. A lot of people say, unity sounds great, what do I do? Serving together, uniting, mentoring, passing along what God has given to us. There's three truths and three different sets of relationships in this message. The first is mentoring connects generations and reaches generations well. It's both, two things. When we mentor the different generations, aren't you glad our church, we have babies that fill up the nursery and we have those who have their eyes set on 100 and are getting close and everyone in between. It's a beautiful, it, we don't take it for granted. It's beautiful to come together and inspire and learn from each other and build relationships that are across generations. And not only that, but when we are united across generations, we also reach generations well and reach the next generation. We begin in Exodus chapter 18 and Jethro is gonna mentor Moses, a father-in-law. How many people really wanna be mentored by their father-in-law? That's a dream setup, isn't it? That's what happened to Moses, God was in it. Moses' father-in-law replied, what, do you, what you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me and I will give you some advice. There's solicited advice and unsolicited advice. I will give you some advice and may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way that they are to live and how they are to behave. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties and tens. Jethro shows up and he has some insights. A wise sage, walk with the wise and you will grow wise. What does he see? He sees Moses' blind spot. Can we all admit we have blind spots? And sometimes our spouse is gonna be the primary one. Sometimes it'll be in our life group, a friend, a mentor. Someone's gonna see what we don't see and have the courage to say, this is not good. This could be better and bring a suggestion, bring a recommendation. Aren't you grateful for people who actually bring recommendations? A lot of people like to go on and on and on, and then this happened, and this is the problem, and this is what I don't like, and then this happened, it's like, could we shift and start moving towards a solution? Could we move with a recommendation instead of just describing again what didn't work again and talking about it some more? Make that pivot. Jethro has a solution, and it's from a heart to serve to serve God, to serve Moses, to serve the people. And what does he say? You, Moses, are overloaded. Isn't that a word for us today in our culture? Would you agree that most people are overloaded? We could hear Jethro saying that to us. You 
are overloaded. You're saying yes to too many things. You haven't said yes to the best. You're saying yes to the best, the good, and the average. You are spread too thin, and you are going to be worn out. This was Jethro's message in love to Moses. Can I tell you what's really, really, really tiring? It's to be doing what God doesn't want you to do. That is the most tiring thing. I'll tell you, I can have a full schedule. I can be doing a lot of things. And if God's in it, and it's my A gift, not my B gift or my C gift, but it's my primary gift, and it's from God, and he wants me to do it, it's not about how many hours a day I'm working, usually. Of course, set limits. Of course, don't just bring leftovers home to the family. I'm not promoting workaholic or anything out of balance. What I am saying is that what you do is very important. And nothing will tire you more than doing what God's called other people to do. And when you're stuck in that rut, sometimes you say, well, this is what I've always done. This is what everyone else is doing. I'll just keep doing all the extras because no one else, well, no one else is, and then underneath it, no one else is quite as talented as me. No one else is desiring this as much as me. No one else is faithful as me. No one else is, and we have all this no one else nonsense going through our minds, and Jethro steps in and says, Moses, here's the solution. Train and empower more people. Train and empower. You're going to delegate. You're going to encourage you don't just hand it off and disappear. You're still going to be with them, encourage them, train them up. If you think about your life and you look back, it's going to be a story of how well and how many people you've trained and passed along. Passed along the blessings that God's given to you. Moses is thinking it's all about him. Well, I'm the only one that God spoke to in a burning bush. I'm the only one you know, that went up on the mountain. I'm the only one that got the Ten Commandments. A lot of times we start going down that road, well, I'm the only one, I'm the only one, I'm the only one, and it'll always land us in the same place. You are overloaded, you're saying yes to too much stuff, you're not empowering enough people. And this is why there's tension between our father-in-laws and, you know, ourselves, because sometimes truth hurts initially, but it's so good. It's going to be freeing. God's truth always frees us. God's truth, although initially we go, that's not what I wanted to hear, it leads to that light and peaceful path. It breaks strongholds in our lives. It shatters lies. Now, who you choose is important. And Jethro continues with great advice. Carefully select, prayerfully select, selectively select who you mentor, who you disciple, who you pour your life into, who you hire, who you partner with in ministry. Carefully select this. Because if you select the right person, the blessings are 10 and 20 fold. And if you select the wrong person, you're going to be cleaning up messes in aisles 1, 2, 5, 7, and 9 every day. It's a big deal who you choose. And that's why it's laid out very clearly who to select. Fearing God, character strong. Make that wise selection. And in all of this, unity is very intentional. There's responsibility given. These aren't just token positions, but I'll do all the work. No, this is teams raised up over you know, different size uh, numbers, over different roles, responsibilities. It's a blueprint that God gives to Jethro, then to Moses. Sometimes your greatest insights, God's gonna give them to someone else, and then they're gonna share them with you. And when you implement them, you're gonna see so much fruit. And this is the starting point. Moses receives. It makes a huge difference. Has someone ever given you some advice that just changed your life? And someone had a conversation with you and it was just life was never the same. And for Moses, this was a turning point because he's teachable. Now we look at Exodus chapter 24. Now Moses is going to be mentoring and he's mentoring Joshua. And we start in verse 12. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and stay here. And I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and commandments I have written for their instruction. Then Moses set out with Joshua his aide, and Moses went up on the mountain of God. He said to the elders, wait here for us until we come back to you. Aaron and Hur are with you, and anyone involved in a dispute can go to them. See, he's putting into practice. When Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days, the cloud covered the mountain, 
And on the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud as he went up on the mountain, and he stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Our first calling is to walk with God, to be with God. Jesus in Mark chapter 3, the first calling is that the people would come to him and be with him. Moses' first calling is with God, but then also there's another with. And in our lives, there should always be another with. With Joshua. Well, who's Joshua? He's the successor. What does Moses invite Joshua into? 40 days and 40 nights. 40 days and 40 nights. This is a long time. This involves fasting and continuing to seek God with all your heart. 40 days and 40 nights, that's a major moment. Don't just invite people into the minor stuff. Oh, here's a little thing you can do. Oh, here's a little thing you can do. Oh, I guess, yeah, that's small enough, you can do that. Invite people into the big stuff. 40 days and 40 nights. There's no way to fast forward that. We live in a microwave culture. We want all of God in 4.4 seconds or else we're gonna swipe to the right. You know, we've got these very short attention spans. Like, God better show up on my terms. I've got four seconds right now. God, do everything you're going to do. That's not the posture. It's not test God. Okay, fit into my schedule, my agenda. They're dropping everything. 40 days, 40 nights. We throw out 28 days of hope. We're talking about 84 days of soaring. We're not just looking for a quick gimmick or a silver bullet. We're talking about cultivating depth with God and that daily habit instead of just seven hours on the phone, seeking God in prayer, seeking God in fasting, walking close with God, hearing God, knowing your purpose. That's what we want to cultivate in a culture that just wants a quick, simple, and easy. And this is where they meet with God. This is where God reveals they have an encounter with God. The clouds, the glory, the presence of God, they're going for it. 40 days, 40 nights. It's when you turn to the person next to you or someone in your family and you say, let's go for it with God. Joshua's thinking, I haven't done this before. What are we doing? We're gonna fast. We're gonna listen. We're gonna climb this mountain. We're gonna meet with God. We're hungry for God's presence. People are hungry for entertainment. They're hungry for recreation. They're hungry for the right clothes. They're hungry to... All kinds of hunger today, but I'm talking about an appetite for God. An appetite for God. Joshua, what are we doing? We're going up on this mountain not to do la-di-da, take a few selfies and post them on social media. That's not why we're going up on the mountain. We're going up on the mountain to have an encounter with the living God. Venture with me, journey with me. Joshua's like, I know you, Moses. I don't think I know God that well yet, but I know you, so... I trust you, let's go do this together. Seek God together, extended prayer, reading the Bible, in your homes, seeking God, that's at the heart of this. In Moses, this encounter with God, it's gonna be one where he receives, and what does God give him? In writing, the 10 commandments. God's revelation has clarity. Aren't you glad? Because you could read that and say, wow, how, imagine what that'd be like to have stone tablets and then God writes in them and you got 10 commandments, whoa! And, and we're like, what a miracle. I can't even imagine that. Well, pick up your Bible, and you know what? The Holy Spirit, these are pages of paper, not stone tablets, but this is the Word of God. Not just 10 commandments, but 66 books. And when we open it up, it's like, wow, God said that to me. God spoke that. I hear God every time I open the Bible. I hear God's voice in that sense of seeking and listening and gratitude that comes. Generations will be blessed because they went on the mountain for 40 days, receive the tablets. Generations, your family will be blessed when at home you open up this book every day and you hear God. You will bless not only your kids, you will bless your children's children. There'll be a legacy and a foundation. We're in a nation right now where there's more and more biblical illiteracy. And what did they do? They received the word and they shared the word with their generation so that the people could know what God said. Everyone just didn't do what you want to do. No, God said it. God declared it. God declares truth. He's the potter. We're the clay. He brings the truth. We don't change who God is. God reveals it. We don't change God's word. It's eternal. And Moses and Joshua understand and they receive. 
and the people are blessed. We've got some other passages. Exodus chapter 33, passion kicks in. Uh, As Moses went into the tent, now they're in the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshiped, each at the entrance to the tent. Now, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. That phrase face to face implies closeness, intimacy, friendship, developing, cultivating a closeness with God. During the week, a closeness with God. Notice Joshua came up the mountain. Now Joshua is going to go into the tent of meeting. The tent of meeting is what God said, build this tent and I'm going to meet with you there. Tent of meeting, kind of self-explanatory. Moses left and what did it say about Joshua? He desired more. He didn't want to leave the tent of meeting. He wanted more of God's presence. And there's going to be times where you look and your kids or people in the next generation, they even want more than what you had. They're hungry beyond your hunger. And you're going to look at that and go, you want to worship more? You want to read the Bible more? You, you want to reach the city more? You're going to see this next generation? Moses didn't go into the promised land, but Joshua wanted to. Joshua did. Caleb did. It started here. Depth with God led to direction. Depth with God led to breakthrough. It started by going deep with God, and then they had faith to believe God's word. And when a generation didn't believe God's word, the next generation said, we'll go further. We'll go further. And that's a celebration because Moses led to a point, and then Joshua's going to be the next one. I think It did Moses' heart good to see Joshua on fire for God. Celebrate when you see the next generation, someone you're mentoring. If they pass you and all of a sudden they're like just uh, going deeper with the Lord and they're more on fire for the Lord and God's using them to change more lives. Like just celebrate it. It's not competition. Just celebrate that. I believe that Moses didn't really understand prayer that much for the first, we could say, 80 years of his life. He lived to 120 But that last third, he heard God clearly. He learned to go face down. He talked about Aaron and her. In the battle, Moses raised his hands in prayer and Aaron and her held up his hands all day. He knew he could trust them in different settings, including prayer. He knew who was going with them in prayer. He knew who was faithful and consistent. And I believe in the last 40 years of his life, Moses' faith ascended and he knew that his time would end And he intentionally started to teach what he was learning late in life. How many times do you think Moses went through his head, wow, imagine if I prayed like this my first 80 years. Imagine if I would have trusted God my first 80 years. Imagine if I would have been training up the next generation for my first 80 years. I think the last third of his life, he realized what it's all about close to God, seeking God, hearing God, training up the next generation, believing God, down on your face when things are hard, praying, crying out. The victory is won in prayer. It's not us. It's not our self-strength. It's not our technology. It's meeting God in prayer. And, And I think that just overflowed. You can't lead someone to be who you're not. You can say awesome things, but what people are gonna imitate is who you really are. You can't fake that. We got a generation that's heard all the right answers, but they have not seen all the right things. And they're hungry to see the right things that would match up with all they've heard and they would take it even further. And then we say, go and be blessed. We're cheering you on. That's it, we're pouring into you. Joshua, go into the promised land that we never did because we didn't trust God like we could have. We're so grateful for the generations. And when God unites the generations, there's this powerful dynamic that happens where we all grow together and then we reach the next generation better and God's work continues. And that's what we get to see here. Uh, Let's move on to the second one. Look for people, because you might say, all right, this mentoring thing, the serving thing, this uniting thing, it's biblical, it's good. I think I want in. I I think I'm ready to go somewhere with this. I want to be a doer of the word. So then what do you do? Here's the next one. Look for people who are faithful, available, and teachable. That was the acronym that went back to when I was in seminary. They said, look for fat people. I was like, what? They said, faithful, available, teachable. 
Look for those people, faithful, available, teachable. And that's when I think when you look at Elijah and Elisha, that's the relationship that we see. This is a point in Elijah serves at one of the lowest in terms of spiritually. There was more deviation, deterioration in the land. It was at a low point spiritually. Uh, We're looking at some numbers in America that would suggest this is a low point in our nation right now, spiritually. So Elijah came first, Elisha came second. J before S in the alphabet, in case you don't remember the order. Elijah came first, and then what happened? There was a lot of victories. People in the land, across the land, they preferred to worship Baal. That doesn't make a lot of sense to us because no one in our land probably worships Baal too much, but we have no lack of idols. Instead of having one prominent idol, we probably have 20 favorite idols. So it's a little different in that sense, but their hearts had drifted from God. And Elijah was bold and he was courageous and he brought the word of God. And then what happened? He got intimidated, just like we get intimidated. And what do you do when you get discouraged and intimidated and fearful and you lose hope? You go in a cave. That's what he did. You get isolated, you retreat, you get quiet, you go in a cave and you start to overfocus on yourself. Don't ever fall into the trap of being fearful, discouraged, and over-focusing on yourself and going into a cave. Don't ever fall in that trap. God's not in that. God meets us in the cave. He calls him forward from the cave. He asks the question, what are you doing here? What are you doing here in the cave? What are you doing here on earth? What are you doing here? And Elijah hears the tender voice of God and then responds. Now, this is from 1 Kings chapter 19, uh, and then verse, starting in verse 18. This is what God told Elijah when he was self-consumed in the cave. God said, yet I reserve 7,000 in the sound. Well, we could say that now. There's more than 7,000. But for him at that context, yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bound down to Baal, whose mouths have not kissed him. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him, threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his ox and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen, slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat, gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. When Elijah was self-consumed, God said, I've got 7,000, and then connect with them. In addition to that, go anoint three, and then go choose one successor. When you're in a position, it's always wise to choose one successor. And then go close. Elijah, go close to Elisha. Why? Because you can impress people from a distance, but you impact up close. You impress people from a distance, but you impact up close. It's not going to happen in the cave. Go to where Elisha is. And there's a call to serve. Elisha is wealthy, a lot of land, wealthy family. What does he do? He, no longer is he going to have the equipment, no longer is he going to have the animals. The Moravians traveled across the world to serve Jesus. And when they finished their journey, you know what they did? Burn the boats because we're not going back. Anyone with their hand to the plow, don't go back. Continue to follow Jesus. And that was Elisha's statement here. Elisha asked, can I say goodbye to my family? Elijah said, please do. Say goodbye to your family. And he did. And now the journey begins. He went to Elisha's hometown. Meet him where he's at. If you're going to mentor someone, you might need to pray for discernment and then go where they are. And then may God lead you as you start to guide and mentor, build them up and empower them. That's what we see here. They walk together, their miracles are similar, their ministry is similar, they walk together, and then at the end of Elijah's life, 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, we see this. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me, what can I do for you before I'm taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. 
And with that request, a bold request, a double portion, what does that mean? The successor, Elisha, had a hunger to see the same God move in power. And that was a good desire. Some people have great desires for the kingdom, for change lives, for their generation. And he communicated that. God blessed him with that. You know, through Elisha, there was a parting of the river. There were a lot of miracles. Haman was healed of leprosy. It was a picture of blessing, not just locally, but globally. And then even one who was dead touched Elijah's bones in the grave and sprung to life. Check out that miracle. There was an anointing on Elijah and there was anointing on Elisha and they were faithful. And notice what happened, the successor, there was a dedication without a hesitation. As you find people who are available, teachable, hungry, faithful, find people who are eager that when you say, here comes, we're gonna go this direction, God's calling us this direction, they're like, let me say goodbye to my family, you know, no longer have the animals, the equipment, because this is a new season of my life and I'm going for it with God. That was the picture in their relationship. It was an intentional legacy. And you might say, well, the successor was so hungry. I mean, a double portion. God blessed him with a double portion. And there's enough. God has enough for both Elijah and Elisha. Amen. God has enough for husband and spouse. God has enough for parents and kids and grandkids. Amen. God has enough for Grace Community Church and the other solid churches in Auburn. Instead of a scarcity mindset, a competition mindset, what is it? It's collaboration. It's expansion. It's multiplication. It's a vision of the kingdom that comes through mentoring. It's not a, well, I got this much and you can't have more than me. No, it's we want the best for everyone. We want grace to be all she's designed to be. We want all the churches churches and the sound to be thriving. We want everyone to be using their gifts for God's glory and drop the pride and celebrate what God's doing through other people. That's what we see. <clears throat> There's one more truth I want to highlight today, and it's this. Be like Jesus. That's our calling, to be like Jesus, and leave a legacy of people you have developed to trust and serve God. I use the word developed. You could also use the word discipled synonymous. Leave a legacy in your life of people who are trusting in serving God, and God has used you to encourage, empower, train, build up these people. And you look at Jesus who ascended into heaven, and he poured his life into those three, and then those 12, and then there's over 70. And you see how intentional he was with his legacy. Don't miss how the master lived out this method and then what he's calling us to do. Very intentional. Paul, who was against Jesus and then experienced the resurrected Jesus, started to imitate Jesus. And Paul left a legacy. We see his relationship with Timothy. This is from 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God our Savior and of Christ, Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true son in the faith, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul would mentor Titus, Mark, uh, Timothy, many, Silas. He had sons in the faith, daughters in the faith, intentional relationships, building people up. In 1 Timothy, if you would keep reading that rest of that chapter, what you'd see is Paul had Timothy to stay in Ephesus and lead and serve there. Timothy was timid. Sometimes you're gonna mentor someone's timid, but you're gonna say, no, God's gonna be sufficient. And you can lead this church in Ephesus, guard them from false teaching, love people well, always just keep teaching the word and living it out and God is gonna bring the results. And he built up Timothy to have a sincere faith. And what you see with Paul and Timothy is what you saw in the other relationships, Moses, uh, Joshua, Elijah, Elisha, is there is a depth with God. There is a depth with God that leads to discipleship. There's a plan that comes from God. And you say, well, is it gonna be easy? Nowhere do I read that it's easy. In fact, usually what I read in the Bible is that the cost is high. And when there'd be large groups around Jesus saying, oh, this sounds so fun, you just get blessings all the time. Jesus would thin the crowds and he would say, no, it's not all about you. 
I blessed you to be a blessing. Lay down your life. Take up your cross. Stop thinking about just yourself. Be fruitful and multiply. We're running discipleship and a kingdom and leading more people to Jesus here. And then what would happen? The crowd would get small. The crowd would get small. Because not everyone wants this stuff. Not everyone wants to do this stuff. And Jesus would thin the crowd. I imagine in the disciples' minds, it was like, Jesus, that was a terrible sermon today. We could have had a mega church in every corner of Judea. What you said today, Jesus, you just shrunk the church 10% now of what we used to have. How are we going to do budget? How are we going to do staff? How are we going to do this? Jesus would bring truth and love. There was an uncompromised, and it'll never change. The vision of the kingdom is about relationships, unity, discipleship, depth, and reaching people who don't know Jesus. And it doesn't matter where you end up at church, never go to a church that waters that down. Never settle for something less than that. Go all out for that. You'll never regret it. When you come before Jesus, you'll never regret living this way. This is the calling in our lives and God's grace will be sufficient in every way. Paul said it to Timothy right here in 2 Timothy chapter two. He said, you then my son, be strong. I'm saying that today. Be courageous in this generation. Be countercultural. Be strong in what? Your own strength? No, in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Strength and grace together. And the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, now entrust to reliable people who also be qualified to teach others. And he gives them these inspiring pictures like a soldier. Well, what does a soldier do? A soldier suffers. A soldier pleases the commanding officer. A soldier has purpose. Timothy, what I'm saying to you, your life's gonna be drenched with purpose. Like an athlete, what does an athlete do? Competes, there's rules, there's a crown, there's victory. Timothy, the path I'm giving you, this is a path of victory and change lives. It's like a farmer, what does a farmer do? Hard work, patience, and then a harvest. If you follow Jesus, you're gonna be like a soldier with great purpose, an athlete with seeing victories, and a farmer that has an incredible harvest. Go deep with God, abide with Jesus, and then pass along. Help others do the same. The kingdom math is multiplication. Don't just help someone, help someone to help others in the same way. Don't just give a handout, train them up how they can fish, and not just that they fish, but now they teach other people how to fish. Don't just teach someone how to pray or someone how to share the faith or someone how to read the Bible. Encourage them to now go train someone else how to do that. That's the kingdom math. It's called multiplication. And otherwise, we'll shrink it down to optional once in a while when I feel like it, a little bit of addition, a little bit of addition. That's never been the kingdom vision. So what I'm saying today is shifting from cultural Christianity to biblical Christianity and it's following Jesus, and it's living it out. What did we see? We saw Bud and Melody realizing we can unite our hearts for the Lord. We can unite in our marriage and serve. We can go into the community where people are and invite them to grace. We can hand out hundreds. We can build relationships with people who don't have homes in our community. It doesn't even have to be an official church program. We're just gonna go deep and abide with Jesus. There might be official church programs. We might go to Honduras. We might go to Cambodia. There, there's human trafficking ministry. There's Compassion Clinic coming up September. There are church things, but there's also just what God's leading us to do and living this out. You say we've highlighted a couple of relationships with men. You know what the Bible says? Same thing for women. Open up the book of Titus. Women, train those who are deep in the Lord. Train those who are new in the faith. Train those women. Be intentional in those relationships. We see it for all ages. You know what's happening here at Grace that we celebrate? Do you know our young adults group just keeps growing? Do you know in the young adults group, then they gather now, there's like over 80 people coming to the young adults group. And <clears throat> it's exciting what God's doing. You know how it's happening? It's this. It's just people pouring their lives into people. And some of the young adults who've known the Lord for a while, they're training up the newer young adults who are just learning about Jesus, starting to grow in their faith. You know what's happening in our church, international student ministry? Why is there a legacy there? Because the same thing is happening and it works in international student ministry. Do you know uh, when you think about our high school ministry, yes, there's a thriving high school ministry, but do you know what else is happening? High school students are serving the middle school students. 
They're just living this out. Do you have to wait until you're 50 to mentor someone? No, you don't. You can do it when you're 16. And you know what happens? Our middle school students, you know what they're doing? They're serving our kids. They're discipling our kids downstairs. That's what the middle school students are doing. This is for all ages. You don't have to wait and graduate from seminary. It's just who wants to do this Jesus stuff and do it together and do it united. That's who God will use, anyone who wants to. And I was thinking this week about people that have poured into my life. I could say the first year, my first four years of following Jesus, there was Mike Helton, there was Brian Birdsall, then there was Jeff Johnson and Carl Hoffman. I'll never forget those four guys the first four years of following Jesus. Never forget those guys and what they deposited into my life. And then, you know, the next four years, I would say Ramesh Richard, Howard Hendricks, uh, Luis Palau, E.K. Bailey. I'll never forget those next four years in those next four guys. You've got a list of people who have poured in to you. Remember them, thank them, honor them, but make sure that's not your only list because the next list is who you have poured into and you want that list to be even longer than the ones who've poured in to you praise god we're alive today praise god we read the bible together today praise god he opens our eyes and gives us a kingdom vision today in biblical christianity now what are we going to do with it. This is not one to just say, well, that sounds solid. Okay, pastor. Yep. That was Bible. I agree. Yeah, it's probably a good idea. No, this is a day where we say yes to unity because we want to soar together. The strength of this church family will come down to not how great, you know, a screen looks or how comfortable a chair is or something that's on the wall in the lobby, the strength of this church will come back to uniting with God first and then how well we unite and strengthen and encourage each other in relationships. And that's what we all choose together. It goes beyond a program. And I wanna share this too. Don't miss the context as we close here. Don't miss the context here that there wasn't a lot of sitting around at coffee shops and talking a good talk. I've got no problem with meeting up at a coffee shop and and talking about faith. That could be part of it. That's wonderful. I, I don't have a problem there. But the picture with Moses and Joshua was not, let's just sit around and talk and maybe study a little. That was not the picture. The picture with Elijah and Elisha was not just, well, let's just talk about the finer points of theology and then sound really impressive. That was not the end goal. The end goal in Paul and Timothy was not like, well, let's just do a study on ministry. All of these contacts were sleeves rolled up in what are we doing? We're praying together. We're seeking God together. We are living it together. We're reaching our generation together. We're doing ministry together. We're using our gifts. We're trusting God. We're gonna build up the local churches. We're gonna lead people to Jesus. That's the context for mentorship in the Bible. Don't ever try to reduce it into some Petri dish or lab or just make it a couple principles. It's about actually doing it together, together. My my prayer in all this is that it's refreshing. My heart in all this is that we're gonna soar. And I don't know any way to soar other than to come back to Jesus, come back to the Bible and just say, let's follow Jesus together. Let's do it not the way it's typical in American Christianity today. Let's do it the way Jesus did it. Let's do it what he said in his word. Because I don't know, what do you think would be better? The way Jesus said to do it or what the committees these days are talking about around the nation? You know, a popular opinion, do we take a vote on what we do or do we just go with Jesus and his plan and how he does it? Which way are we going, right? So let's go with Jesus, church. Here's a couple of things as we close. Um, If you're here today and you don't know the Lord, great opportunity to say, I want to follow Jesus. I want him to be my Lord and Savior. Can't save myself. I need forgiveness of sins, just like everyone in this room. And you've thought about it. You've heard about it. You know people who decide to follow Jesus. You make your own decision today. And you can let us know in the prayer team. Let them know in the connecting center or just text the word. Say, I'm ready. I want to make that decision. Baptism, we've got people getting ready to be baptized next month. It's happening every month. Why? Because people are making decisions. We're going to celebrate with them. Maybe you haven't been baptized in water and you want that information. Again, Let us know, text the word baptism. Membership is when you just know this is gonna be my church family. I'm not here to watch. I'm here to build relationships, build community. I'm here to build people up and serve and use my gifts. 
This is gonna be my church family right now. That's what that is, membership. Group, we have over 80 life groups. Why do we have them? Because this is a big room. But in a life group, you've got that eight, 12, 15 people, meet in a home, get into God's word together. You just can't beat God's word, God's spirit, God's people, and then doing that consistently. You, you can't beat that. That was Jesus who started that. That's what we do here. And then we've got serving. Why? Because we're all gifted from God. Everyone in this room is made in God's image. Everyone in this room, gifted, talented. And the more we say, I'm here to serve, not to be served, but I'm here to serve. When you follow Jesus like that, everyone is built up. And we believe it's more exciting and fulfilling to be on the field versus just sitting back and critiquing everyone else that's on the field. We do it, we grow together, we learn together. So these are opportunities. How is God leading you today? And then let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your goodness to us. Jesus, you change our lives daily and eternally, and we give you praise. Father, we're all grown in our faith together. None of us has it figured out. All of us are relying on you. All of us are trying to figure out what it looks like in 2024 in our life situation, in our health situation, our financial situation, in situations that we see in our nation right now. God, we're trying to listen to you and be faithful. We're trying to trust you and be led by the Spirit. God, we're trying to do it united when this is a culture of division. We want to reject the hopelessness, God. We're believing you for something different. God, we're seeing so much fruit right now, and we're thanking you for that. May you get all the glory. We thank you that it's just the start. The best is yet to come. And together, we give you praise and honor. We worship you. Take over in our lives, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The prayer team's over to my right. Please make your way forward. Share with us how God's moving in your life. We'll pray for you. Connecting centers out there. Have a great week walking with Jesus.